Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're talking about error and conflict in the early church. And this video is important because I'm highlighting errors in thinking that you probably have. There are common errors in thinking that many people in the church have with regard to the early church. And we want to squash some of those errors and correct our collective way of thinking about the early church and about what happens when we look at the Bible. One of our big problems when we look at scriptures, we see the whole thing as this, as this religious book. And so every time we look at the book, you pull your Bible out and you open it and you, and you think that there's something going on there other than just plain ordinary language. And we have to put that aside and just pay attention to what the text is saying and then make judgments and assessments on that on based on what should happen. What do I mean by this? There are some examples in the Bible that aren't good. Not everything in the book of Acts, for example, not everything you see everybody do in the book of Acts is good. You should look at the book of Acts perhaps the same way you look at 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, right? There, like David is a good guy, but not everything David did was good, okay? Um, you might want to be a man after God's own heart, but you might not want to do, you know, commit adultery and murder, which is recorded as what David did. Um, Solomon did some good things, but you don't want to do everything he did. Saul did some good things, but you don't want to do everything he did. You have kings like Josiah, but you also have kings like Rehoboam, okay? Just because somebody's name shows up in a passage of scripture does not mean that they automatically are flawless and infallible and did everything good. And I hear a lot of Christians saying, well, if we could just get back to the church they had in the book of Acts. No, you don't want that. Today we're going to discuss why you don't want that. And, oh, I wish we could just get back to the early church. And there is this presumption that people in the early church were doing everything correctly. They were not. They were not at all. And that would be, that would be like trying to go back to the time you were a toddler to find out how you should live now. That's the exact opposite of what you want to do. There's a lot of wisdom and things that you gain along the way and you want to find out what all of that is. Now, we may use some language and terminology today that has showed up in previous places. Like we did a, we did a video recently on the Mammon Church, for example. And you may want to take a look at that um, as we move forward today some of the language and terminology that we may use will presume that you have seen that video. Also, we have two videos on the faith crisis. And so you're going to want to also make sure that you have seen the faith crisis parts one and two, because we may cover some things today that if you feel lost or you feel like you don't understand my vocabulary or the language that I'm using, if you were to watch those videos first, then this video will come out differently to you. If you're going to write something in the chat or in the comments questioning or disagreeing with what I'm saying first, that is probably a 90% chance that that question would go away if you would watch those videos first. We had that happen a couple of times already. I've encouraged people to watch these prerequisite videos. They make a comment and I ask them, did you watch these videos which I said in the video you're commenting on to watch? Like, no, I didn't. I guess I better go back and do that. Yes, okay. I can't put everything in one single video and so necessarily the information that we provide here has to be cumulative. Also, the information that we provide here is uh, it's unique. You're not going to get it anywhere else. And if you would like to see this continue, we invite you to support the channel. The details to do so are in the description below. We could not do this without you. What we do here takes time, space, uh, resources, energy, money, all sorts of things like that. And if you want to see it continue and see it continue ad free, um, this is the only place that you can get it. We invite you to support it. We're not following any curriculum. We're not following anything you get from a uh, seminary or any particular denomination or systematic theology. We're not following any of that stuff. We are finding the Christ-like version of our future self here in a way that is more effective than how you could do it anywhere else. All right, guaranteed or your money back. I'm just kidding. Um, no guarantees here. So we're talking about error and conflict in the early church, and I want to take you to a non a non sacred source first, so that you can kind of get a grasp of where I'm going to be coming from with some of the things I'm going to talk about. 
on this channel, we've talked about World War Z. And by the way, we are in a series through the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 15 today. All right. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, we have done lots of other videos. I think we're 68 or something like that videos on the book of Acts. And this is, uh, we're in Acts chapter 15. So we have covered a lot of other stuff in the book of Acts leading up to this point. And we're hoping that you're familiar with that content leading forward, or at least with what we've talked about with how Cornelius has really set the stage for transitioning away from a Jewish centric presentation of the gospel to wide open everybody, la di da -di, nothing is Jew centric anymore. It's, it's wide open to anybody and you don't have to, you know, be circumcised or keep the law in order to be saved. That kind of stuff is what's going forward. Now, if, uh, we did a video here on World War Z a while back, and we talked about a lot of good things that the character did for which no rules could be written. There couldn't be no prescription, and that would be a script written ahead of time for what you should do in any given scenario. You can't write a prescription for unpredictable scenarios, okay? And so he finds himself in a lot of unpredictable scenarios, and we point out how breaking normal rules was the appropriate thing to do in all of these scenarios. Well, there's one, a lot of great things the character does in the movie, but there's one boneheaded thing that he does. He is uh, going on an airfield and they have to be very quiet. And so over here on the right hand side, in the middle here, they're riding their bikes on the airfield so that they're not making any footsteps because they want to keep the zombies quiet, right? because they wake up with sound. So they're trying to go as quietly as possible without any making footsteps, and they're going to roll out there on bicycle wheels. Well, it just so happens that the main character's cell phone starts going off. And as you can imagine, the fur hits the fan, all the zombies wake up, and lots of people die. It's terrible. Why am I saying that? Because even though you have a character who largely does a whole bunch of things right, he does do something wrong, and it's appropriate to look at a good character and see that they are not flawless and infallible, that they do make some mistakes. In the book of Acts, what we're going to see is that people make mistakes, and we're going to look at some of those mistakes uh, moving forward. And also, people carry this idea into the, like the early church fathers, now, there's a, here's, a, here's a posting from a Calvinist in a Facebook group. The early church fathers, and this is this Calvinist saying this, not me. And he's, this isn't even really about Calvinism. The early church fathers weren't always 100% correct in their theology. Now, what does he mean by theology? He is thinking of something like this because he's a Calvinist. He's thinking of some kind of systematic theology where a bunch of propositions are written down that everybody should follow or believe or affirm, like mental, mental assent to something like this. Now, if you hear me say somebody's, I don't know, theology, it might have something more to do with practical things like doing, being, and becoming more like Christ. On this channel, we, are, we interface with Scripture not to come to conclusions about what we should affirm or believe, but with how we can transform to be more like Christ and how we can edify other people to transform to be like Christ and how we can follow the pattern of Christ in our everyday life. That's what we are trying to do. We don't place so much of an emphasis on what we think people should or should not affirm. That's not really the deal here. But, and so... We've pointed this out in some of our previous videos, all right? The ones that I said that you should watch already, you need to make sure you understand those and you'll understand my comments just fine. So he says, anybody can use bits and pieces of their writings to support their theological convictions. Well, of course, he's going to say this because uh, he understands that the early church fathers did not support determinism, which as a Calvinist, you wish they did. And they have to admit that determinism and the Menachian Gnostic infusion of ideas into professing Christianity of the day didn't occur until the time of Augustine when he brought it from Menachian Gnosticism. And they have, to, they have to ultimately admit that, okay? So they, he has to admit, okay, they weren't always correct. They should have been determinists, but they weren't. It's, it's another way kind of a saying this. But anyway, this isn't really about Calvinism. So he says... Yet they were all unanimously convinced that blank weren't blank like modern day evangelicals believe. Now, the reason I redacted that and crossed that stuff out is because people in the chat 
tend not to be mature enough to see the actual topic and then not jump, forget the point that I'm making. What they will do is they will forget the point that I'm making and they will start debating about that topic rather than focus on the point that I'm making. So I'm trying to protect your little pea brains from doing that by redacting this for you so that you can pay attention to what I'm trying to say because it is more important than the little stuff that's blocked out here that you would squirrel, you would you would be distracted to debate, all right? And I'm trying to help you grow out of that, all right? So that's not important. But notice it's that, that weren't blank like modern day evangelicals believe. Now, first of all, who cares? People say, well, we have the truth and we have we have the true beliefs and that kind of stuff. Well, like we've said on this channel many times, don't tell me what you believe, show me how it has transformed you, okay? How does, how does that make you a better father or a better husband or a better wife or a better grocery shopper or a better citizen? How does that help you do be and become better? How does that do that? It doesn't, okay? It actually makes you worse. When you have a belief system in having mode, it actually causes you to replicate the behavioral patterns that are found in cluster B personality disorders. That's not what we want to do, so we're trying to avoid that, okay? He goes on to say, they held to blank, and he lists this thing, without question. Now, first of all, who cares what they held to? Now, the real reason I'm showing you this is to show you that it's there is no shortage of arguments that go toward the early church fathers supported X, Y, Z, and that is a good argument for why we should support it. And it's usually some kind of static, you know, semantically disambiguated propositional truth claim, none of which helps you transform. Some kind of nonsense out of some... And when I hold this up, somebody thought, somebody tried to warn me, that blue book that you're holding up is, you know, it's, it's got Calvinist... And we hold this up as an example of what not to do. When you see a book like this, you should... You should, it should make you feel the same way as when you drink old stagnant pond water with bacteria and scum floating around in it, okay? That's, that's what this should make you feel like. This is a bad thing. You don't want this. It's a very bad thing. And so there's all kinds of appeals to the early church fathers. And the idea is this. The idea is that there's this assumption that the apostles were flawless and infallible. Now, they won't come out and say that, but that assumption is left unchecked and unaddressed there. And then the closer you are to the apostles, like if you, John's apostle, uh, start, <laughs> it starts with a P, I forgot what his name was, and I'm sure somebody will put it in the chat. But who, like whoever came right after the apostles, those people are the most correct people. And then, and then everything started degrading and getting worse from there and here we are in the Laodicean church era where everything is just a free for all everything's terrible that is not the model presented in scripture and i know that's the common thinking even with you know people who are more propositionally correct uh that still seems to be also the thinking that everything started off good and perfect and wonderful and that we've just degraded from there like entropy has set in whereas really the right way to think about it is kind of like a child growing up to where, you know, the moment you start breathing, you are headed toward your death. Of course, there is some entropy there, but the idea is that you're growing up into maturity. And I'll show you the passage for that in the scripture. But I want you to think about this. Um, this Calvinist here is talking about theology. He's talking about the writings of those guys to support theological, theological convictions. What do you mean by that? Okay. Yet they were all unanimously convinced that, and then there's, there's some propositions here that don't affect anything about the way you live, about how good of a father or brother or mother you are, or how good of a citizen you are. They don't affect any of that. Nothing in here affects how good of anything you are, but the, you know they have to support these things. And he's trying to make an argument that you should support this kind of stuff. So we're going to do a foray into the four kinds of knowing and ask you this question. In the four kinds of knowing, where is that kind of thinking? Is it with participatory? Are you, do you have any firsthand experience of what they're talking about there? Some kind of beliefs that the early church fathers held about something that's metaphysical that you couldn't prove if you had to? No, it's not participatory. It's not perspectival. It's not procedural. There's nothing you're 
doing there, you're just affirming something that maybe somebody else or something else did. What is it? It's just empty propositional knowing. Now, when the Bible says knowledge puffeth up, what it, what's going on there is you have propositions. I affirm that, and then you state something that does not report, that does not signify or point to back to anything that is in the other three kinds of knowing. Okay, the only proposition, people, we start every, like just this week, I got people telling, you know, writing in saying, but this is a proposition. I'm, we are not against propositions. We are for propositions. The same way we are for the necessity of, of currency and money, for example. Propositional knowledge is the currency of knowing. You have to have it. It's what separates us from the animals. It makes all kinds of things possible. But just like money that can't buy anything, like monopoly money, for example, just like money that can't buy anything, propositions that don't point to one of the other three kinds of knowing also aren't transmitting any real knowledge. They're transmitting a, like what you might call a knowledge bubble. Somebody thinking they know something, but they actually don't know it. If you want an example of this, listen to anything James White ever says, okay? Something like that. Just a bunch of stuff coming out of their mouth that doesn't point to anything real, that has any participatory perspectival or procedural knowing that they can epistemically or, you know, verify in any kind of objective way. Not that everything real is objective, because there are some real things that are subjective. But hopefully you get my point, all right? So I want you to listen with Rule Omega when I start talking about these things. Try to hear the, the thing that's trying to be said. Because what will happen is I'll say something about the four kinds of knowing. Let me get this. <laughs> I'll say something about the four kinds of knowing, and I'll say, a, you know, propositional knowing. Propositions need to point back to the one of the other three kinds of knowing. And some smart aleck in the comments will go, well, that's a proposition too, and that's your belief system, all right? And these kinds of guys, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant, okay? These kinds of you're not you're not playing with a full deck, and you're not serious, and you're not earnest, okay? If you were earnest, you would listen to what I'm saying. It's very important that you listen to what I'm saying. Now, another way to look at the four kinds of knowing, I have this error, this arrow, arrow, not error, arrow here, that has you moving through life, your movement through reality, life and time. And as you encounter things, that is your participatory knowing. And then you get a perspective on it. So let's say you're married and you encounter a conflict with your spouse. That's participatory knowing. And then you have a certain perspective on it. And then you're going to react or not react. You're going to do something about it. And eventually you may have words to describe what happened, or you may be too stupid to figure out what happened. Um, in my own situation, in my own life, there were things that happened in, in, in my previous life where I didn't know what the, I knew something happening that didn't make a lot of sense, but I didn't have good propositions to explain what was going on. And I was ignorant about a lot of things. Later on, I got educated about what certain things were called and how they could be categorized into certain propositional frameworks, which were very helpful to help me understand. But the perspectival, the participatory perspectival and procedural was happening regardless of whether or not I was aware of the propositions that signified those things. Okay. Those things are real. They happen with or without propositions. Propositions can help us categorize them and can help us navigate and understand them, but they are not the thing. You see, the thing happened without them. And that's how life is. So over here, the further you get into participatory, we have a spectrum of charitable versus categorical. All right. We want to be more charitable and less categorical. In other words, um, I have a wife, right? Well, if I have a wife, then perhaps Paula is just filling in a slot in my, the category of wife in my life, right? Whereas if I'm being a husband, I am being, I can be charitable toward her as a person and be char charitable toward her whether or not she fits that categorical overlay, okay? Those kinds of things. So, is your, um, so we cover a lot of this in a lot of our previous videos, okay? 
for those of you just joining us. So this kind of thing is important. So when you have somebody talking about the early church fathers and what they believed and they were convinced and their theology and they held to this without question, that it's all propositional knowing and none of it is pointing to anything real. None of it is pointing or signifying anything that is in the other three kinds of knowing, which in order for propositions to be real, they need to do that. Now, the church, what is it supposed to be doing? Till we all come, we're in Ephesians 4 here, and I have a, a diagram over here on the right-hand side, which basically shows, you know, people going from infants to old age. You're supposed to grow up into something. You would, you would hope that by the time somebody reaches an older age that they have, they have wisdom, and they walk in wisdom, and they can share that with the younger generations so that the younger generations can walk in more wisdom. The idea, even of all mankind, if we had a better sense of coherence, every generation should walk in a little bit more wisdom than the previous generation did. That's what should happen. So in Ephesians 4, which we've also covered a lot on this channel, there's a certain edification model until something happens. Now look at this new edification model. Instead of the five-fold ministry at edifying people. Now you have a different edification model till we all come to the unity of faith, not conflict, but unity, not disunity, but unity and knowledge of the son of God into a perfect man and not knowledge of propositions. Not that we all have the same doctrinal statement that we all believe in. No, 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 no. But unity of these other kinds of things that are up here. All right. That sort of thing unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So you're supposed to be growing up into something, which is what we will see in verse 15, right? That we henceforth be no more children. Don't be naive. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Don't be fragile. So naivety and fragility. We want to be post-naive and anti-fragile. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but... Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him. Now, let me go back sentence structure that we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. The idea of the church when Paul was around was that it was in a child. It would be no more children. The church was a child at the time of Paul. And it's tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. We don't want to be a child. We want to grow up into Christ in all things, which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working of the measure in every part, making the increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. So now every joint in the body, that's you and me and everybody, not just pastors or teachers or evangelists or apostles or prophets, not just those people, but everybody, la di da -di, is participating in the edification process. What that means is that if you are going to participate in the edification process, you need to bring more to the table. You have to grow and, and be transformed and bring that transformation to the insight market exchange of the other Christians, if you will. There, there needs to be some ego transcendence, some self-work, self-worth, uh, self-work, uh, <laughs> where you know yourself a good bit. And you understand the human body as a data processor and how it works. Now, we're going to show how Paul did this in a few minutes, too. So this is what we're aiming at here. So do not view the early church, either in the book of Acts or the early church fathers, as if that is that like it started off right and we've been going downhill ever since. No, it started off as a foolish, blubbering child. And what we are supposed to do is to grow up. That's the trajectory that we're on, and that's how you should see the early church and the early church fathers. Now, let's look at some of our passages for, well, here's a, I want to give you this note that I wrote to kind of set the tone for what we're going to look at when we're looking at Acts 15. This is a note that I keep, I keep this on my phone in my Olive Tree Bible app, and I, and I recommend that as... This could be bad because people could hang on to the formulaic propositional stuff. But for the past several years, I've been keeping notes on topics and passages in my Olive Tree Bible apps, categorized various different ways, tagged various different ways to help me find them when I need them. 
And as I was dealing with Catholicism, Catholicism, Protestants, that a lot of people make this mistake of thinking that the closer you get to the apostles, the more correct you are. They're also, that is based on the premise mistake that the Bible was some kind of input to some kind of propositional systematic theology, which it is not. It's supposed to be a point of inf- interface for personal transformation. That's what it's supposed to be. But when you mistake what it's there for and you start to think of it as some kind of input to a s- semantically disambiguated propositional truth claim set, then you get all disoriented. And everything you say at that point essentially becomes profane. And it subverts people rather than helps them. You basically create a bunch of people with... Uh, you, People holding belief systems in having mode, uh, walking around, replicating all the behaviors that are found in cluster B personality disorder uh, victims. And that's not what you want. And we want to get away from that. So here's the, one of the notes that I wrote to, to show some of these clowns. While the apostles were still alive, they were battling false doctrine. There were false brethren, and I have references here that I'm not going to take the time to quote or cite, um, but you can see them on the screen. False teachers and false prophets, false apostles, people forging letters from the apostles as if they were from the apostles, and plenty of warning to watch out for deception. Meanwhile, the apostles gave instruction to mark and avoid people teaching false doctrine, to withdraw from corrupt, perverse teachers, to withdraw from disorderly brethren, and to turn away from wicked religious people. Furthermore, religious people, okay? Oh, we should treat everyone like they're a brother in Christ. No. Absolutely not. <laughs> That's all, here on this channel, we don't make the assessment of whether or not somebody is a brother in Christ or whether or not they are saved. We don't, we don't fool with that at all. What we do is we assess whether or not people are trying to do the same thing we are trying to do. And if they're trying to do the same thing that we're trying to do, then we can do it together. If they are not, they can go do what they're trying to do with someone else who's trying to do that. Furthermore, people are warned against by name, such as Diotrephes, Demas, Alexander the Coppersmith, Hymenaeus, and Philetus. To top it all off, Peter has a pattern of needing to be corrected, like when Jesus called him Satan, when he denied Christ three times, and when Paul had to correct Peter, withstanding him to the face for legalistic dissimulation. With all this in mind, I'm honestly baffled by a trend that I see for some reason despite the apostles facing all this error in their own lifetime. There is overwhelming assumption that as soon as the apostles died, here are some common incorrect assumptions by people who make their arguments based on the ECFs, the early church fathers, which should be called the early church babies. Okay, They assume that all this error magically disappeared after the death of the apostles. Now, they will not come out, if I were to put this in front of their face, they wouldn't agree with this. But when you listen to their arguments, they don't know that these are underlying assumptions. These are called presuppositions, and people are blind to their presuppositions. And what they don't know is that they are presupposing these things without realizing that they presuppose these things. So my idea, my idea here is to help people realize that they're presupposing these things. They presuppose that all this error magically disappeared after the death of the apostles. Anyone who wrote anything was automatically infallible and we should follow those people. You know, whether it's, you know, Tertullian or Justin Martyr or Arrhenius, Irenaeus, we should follow, the, the, they are infallible and we should follow them. The Didache, the Christians, uh, the third pre- presupposition, the Christians who believe the truth happen to magically be the ones writing and the only one at that. It could be that the ones who had the truth didn't get their writings published, or they had them burned, or they didn't write anything. Uh, fourth presupposition, there were no false teachers writing or teaching anything during the post-apostolic era. Well, that can't be true. The fifth presupposition, finding a first century practice or teaching automatically validates it as authentic. That's not, that doesn't make it true. They were baptized, you know, um, John's Apostle, the guy that starts with a P, part, I, can't, I don't know why I can't remember his name. He was baptized as a baby because he says, 80 and four years have I served the Lord and da, 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 da. That means he had to have been baptized as a baby. Okay, that kind of thing. 
It's nonsense. Or uh, origin. Like Philip Schaff says that adult baptism was a norm until the third century. Well, origin, who was born in like 181, he was baptized as a baby. So they're like, well, that proves that baby baptism was the widely accepted thing. Well, no, it doesn't. Okay, he's the exception. Uh, especially down there in the school of Alexandria. Anyone, uh, the sixth false presupposition is anyone who believed the truth also wrote about it. Okay, so my question to these presuppositions are, what accounts for the above six trends? Why do people assume these things? And they're usually blind to these presuppositions. They don't know that they assume them, but they do. Why do they assume these things? And my second question is if you realize the flaws in the above six assumptions, then what is the epistemological basis against which non-scriptural writings and people should be measured? What do I mean by that? People take non-scriptural writings and they try to justify them by saying that some of the, some of the early church fathers also said the same thing. Well, if the early church fathers might also be in error, then what are we to, supposed to compare things to? Well, the idea here when I wrote this was that we should always go back to Scripture, not to these early church fathers. Well, now even when you're looking at Scripture, you have to understand, like I pointed out over here, Scripture records a bunch of bad guys doing a bunch of bad things and a bunch of good guys making mistakes. Right? So you have to understand that. Acts 15. Acts 15. What's going on in Acts 15? It's the first time chronologically salvation by grace through faith shows up. I will share this Bible screen here. Let me go to Acts 15. And they have this question. Now, this is verse 7. Peter stands up and he says, you know, a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. What's he talking about? Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his household. And that becomes the example of how salvation works for Jews and Gentiles here doctrinally in this passage. And now what we learn from this is not that we should have church councils and decide propositions. What we learn from this is that participatory knowing should inform our practice and what we affirm, what we believe. Okay, The propositions that we use should be informed by participatory knowing. That's what's happening. That's what's happening here. That's the moral of the story. Not that we should have church councils and decide a bunch of things about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin and whether or not um, uh, Mary was immaculately conceived. <laughs> you know, how would you possibly know that? There's no Bible verse for that. There's no nothing for that, right? So we start with pro what they're doing here. The pattern is that they're starting with participatory knowing. We were there. We participated. We were preaching the gospel they started speaking in tongues. They're uncircumcised. They're not proselytes. They're not following. And we had only been preaching to Jews so far, Acts eleven nineteen. And these guys, Gentiles, straight up Gentiles, bam, they automatically start speaking in tongues the same way we did back in Acts chapter 2. So participatorily, we know that God is in this because we participated in that event. And now the participation results in propositions. So propositions are good and okay as long as they point back to something that is in the other three kinds of knowing, something that is real, not something that is not in the other three kinds of knowing. Put no difference between us purifying their hearts by faith. Bam. Between us and them, that would be Jews and Gentiles, purifying their Gentile hearts by faith. Pay attention to that word faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, because they're trying to make them keep the law and be circumcised? But we believe that through the grace, not keeping the law, but through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. We Jews shall be saved even as they. Grace. Here you have faith. Here you have grace. For the first time, chronologically, remember, the Gospel of John is not written yet. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John are not written yet. Acts is just happening. Here, chronologically, for the first time, is the first time everybody is being exposed and coming together on the idea that salvation is by grace through faith without the Sorry, deeds of the law, just... without the deeds of the law of the Old Testament, and that it's for both Jews and Gentiles the same way. That's the first time that appears. That's the controversy, right? Now, if you could imagine, imagine, put yourself in the shoes of a Jewish believer at that time. Now, 
for those of you just joining us, we have to point this out. I know, I know we got the Great Commission. I know we got all this stuff. Everybody's preaching to the Gentiles and everybody preach the gospel to every creature. But you have to understand in the book of Acts, so far in Acts 11, they're preaching to just Jews only. That's how they are doing things. So this is another Jews and Jewish proselytes, people who had either converted to Judaism, proselytes, or natural born Jews who had been born that way, circumcised on the eighth day, all that kind of stuff. So that's their only audience that they're worried about. And this idea of Gentiles getting saved is a Johnny-come-lately idea. And we've talked in, in all of our previous videos, we've covered this many, many times on, you know, going back to Matthew 10 and Matthew 15 and why this was happening this way, okay? But just because you're in the New Testament doesn't mean everything is Gentiles yet. It, it has to happen slowly. And here we're in the middle of this transition where they're transitioning over to where the Gentiles. So what's going on in Acts 15? Well, Acts 15, we were just in Acts 15, by the way, showing what Peter was using the Cornelius event to decide that, hey, so he's using that participatory experience, participatory, perspectival, procedural experience to formulate the propositions in Acts 15 that salvation is by grace through faith for everyone whether or not they are Jew, that's the first time that shows up chronologically where everybody's getting exposed to it, officially, all right? And then meanwhile, Paul has been traveling around Acts 13, 14, preaching the gospel to a whole bunch of Gentiles in Asia Minor, too. So that's all going on. So you have participatory um, knowledge of all that kind of stuff happening. before they coalesce it into propositions. So in Acts 15, 1, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. In other words, we're only preaching to Jewish proselytes here, and you need to go through the proselyte process, which includes following the law and being circumcised in order to be saved. Because this gets worded a few different ways. And let's look at a couple of those. Acts 15, 5 through 6. But they rose up, so they came to, dis to you know, consider this matter. They go to Jerusalem. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. Isn't that interesting? You have believing Pharisees. So all those Jews back there in the book of Matthew, all those Pharisees where Jesus says, I've spoken to you in, par in parables that hearing you may not hear and seeing you not see, lest you should believe and your sins be forgiven you. That's not some Calvinistic thing where they're being boxed out forever. A lot of those Pharisees later come to believe. But it was important to establish a clear segregation of, of descendancy of truth, if you will, like establishment leadership, if you will. Like John Maxwell says, whenever you take over an organization, you fire all the leaders. So when Jesus shows up, he can't just take all the religious leaders and put them in charge because then they would keep all the error that was going on that would be an endorsement of all that error. So he has to start from scratch with his own apostles, a new regime, and he has to find a way to keep the other establishment out at least for a certain time. And then when they do come in, they have to be taught the new way. Well, here's one of the growing pains they encounter. Pharisees are in. They believe. Jesus is the Messiah. They're on board. But they still want everybody to have to keep the law and be circumcised. So they come up saying that it's needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. So there they are in Israel. And James decides to write some letters. He says, okay, we've heard Peter we know Paul is traveling around preaching to all these Gentiles, so the consensus is that you don't have to be a Jew, you don't have to be a proselyte, you don't have to be circumcised or keep the law in order to be saved, so let's officially write a bunch of letters out confirming this. For as, and part of the letter should, would say this, and I just have part of it here for clarity. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words Subverting your souls. Subverting means to make to turn upside down and to make a catastrophe of your soul. Saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. In other words, we are, this is not our official message. We are not saying all these people like Cornelius out there, and we're not saying they have to be circumcised and keep the law. But somebody's going out there like Cornelius, somebody like Cornelius will get saved and they will 
go out there, these these kind of Pharisee type people will go out there and say, well, you got to be circumcised, keep the law. You can't just you can't just jump on the uh, bandwagon here and do this. Let me. Um, so you can imagine, imagine something something that you hold as a staple. All right. I don't know. Maybe you're a Baptist, and um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of something. And maybe somebody shows up and says, "Look, people don't have to be baptized." I don't know. Or maybe you're a Catholic, and people say, "Look, you don't have to go to mass or follow any of the sacraments." There's something that you hold dear that suddenly you find out people can come to Christ and they don't have to do your thing your way, right? You get upset about it. You're like, "Hey, we had a members only club." I want you to think about this in terms of the moral foundation theory, Jonathan Haidt. What's going on here? This is helpful when you're talking with somebody you disagree with. There are six basic moral foundations that through research they have discovered people are upset about when something is not going how they think it should be going. And it's moralistic, not epistemic, right? So what's going on here? Is it a care harm thing? Are they think somebody's being harmed unfairly? No. Do they... Um, is it a liberty oppression thing? Do they think somebody's in bondage that shouldn't be? Now, the other way around, the people like Peter, why, tempt, why put a yoke upon the neck of the apostles? They don't think there should be, they think the law, the law is kind of presented in Acts 15 is kind of oppressive. And we don't need to be oppressed by it. Neither do these Gentiles need to be oppressed by it. So for those people, liberty and oppression was kind of a thing. But the, Pharisees, it wasn't so much this issue. They were willing for everybody following Christ to be oppressed by the law. So that wasn't an issue for them, but it was for Peter and Paul and crew, you see? And so whenever you're encountering arguments from people what, on any issue you can think of, whether it's global warming or abortion or the latest Supreme Court decision, whatever it is, think about what you think is going on here. Is fairness cheating an issue here? Could be because the Pharisees are like, hey, we had to be circumcised. We had to keep the law. All these other people, Acts chapters 1 through 7, we were only preaching to Jews only. And you couldn't, you couldn't get in unless you were being circumcised and keep the law. It's not fair that they had to be circumcised and these guys don't. That could be an issue. Loyalty and betrayal. We are loyal to Moses and we are loyal to the law. And I feel like I'm betraying Moses if I don't perpetuate the following and the keeping of the law, right? Authority subversion. That's another moral foundation they've discovered through research. When people feel like a legitimate authority is being subverted. Moses is our authority. We follow Moses and we feel like it's being subverted here. The Old Testament, the Torah is our authority and we feel like it's being subverted here by this new thing coming in. Sanctity degradation, another or the divine ethic, all right? We feel like um, you're degrading. This is a degradation. This is abomination to, you know, we have all these laws. And if we, if we uh, get tattoos or if we wear clothes that have diverse kinds of material in them, we feel like we're committing a degradation and abomination into the sanctity of the divine ethic that's been handed down to us, right? Think about some of these, when people have disagreements, think about the moral foundations theory and think about the categories of morality in which the disagreement resides or what is being emphasized and how the person is talking. And perhaps, perhaps you can use this in order to relate to the person better and show them how the thing that they care about, maybe it is sanctity degradation, show them how that the correct way is not um, upsetting what they think is sanct sanctified or sacred or holy, and it's not degrading or an abomination or anything like that. Show them that if that seems to be what they think they're on about. Now, this whole, this is where a divine ethic comes in, and the sanctity degradation is like when something is right or wrong for the sole purpose, the, for the sole purpose that an authority like God said it was right or wrong. And that's the only thing that comes. That's an abomination to God. You can't do that. Well, what I encourage you to do as a Christian is to stop thinking that way. We were under a schoolmaster, right? But at, Which was the law. But the law is no longer our schoolmaster. So what a lot of modern day Christians have done is they've substituted one schoolmaster for another. 
You're not supposed to be under a different schoolmaster. You're not supposed to be under any schoolmaster. You see? It's, it's different now. Uh, like World War Z, time of Kairos. It is time to uh, act appropriately for the situation and you should be you should grow into a person that is wise enough to where you don't need to have morality handed down to you, but you can make good, right, moral, just decisions without having to have something dictated to you by a parent figure, whether it be a church or an actual parent or by God, right? Just as a toddler grows out of needing, you know, in a young, like a child, you grow out of needing a parent to tell you when bedtime is and when you should brush your teeth and when you should do your laundry. You should grow out of that, but it doesn't mean you're going to stop doing those things. It just means you don't need them to come from them anymore. The same thing goes with the divine ethic. The divine ethic, the... Old Testament law was given as a schoolmaster until a certain time. And the New Testament law is also, it's like, I say law, the guidelines, vices and virtues, do's and don'ts in the New Testament are more or less for people pre-transformational. Before, before there is a transformation into a process of wisdom into the ability we're able to walk with wisdom. Before you are there, there has to be guidelines handed down from somewhere else because you are not capable of d deriving appropriate guidelines for where you are in your situation yet. So you have to have someone else dictate them to you. The, the problem with that is that you are inevitably going to encounter situations for which no divine ethic could have been dictated. Because not everything can be predicted or has been predicted. You're going to encounter novel situations that these rules don't prepare you for. So you have to be walking in wisdom, no longer under the schoolmaster, Old Testament or New Testament. Those are like guidelines for the transformation waiting room, right? Uh, what are you supposed to do in a waiting room? That's the same. That's, that's the kind of guide. That's how you should look at the do's and don'ts that are given to you in the New Testament. Really, everything boils down to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then that should dictate the appropriateness of every other action that you do. All right? So the more you're pointing toward rules and regulations in the New Testament for how to, what you should do, um, the less wise you are. All right? Now, somebody wrote a comment recently. You're on dangerous territory here, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And that's, that's the kind of nonsense that we don't need. Because obviously the devil tempts people, this will make you wise. But there are no shortcuts to wisdom. But the Bible tells you very clearly in Proverbs 8 and in Proverbs 1 through 8 to seek after wisdom. And to, uh, and Paul says to press toward the mark. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to help you with this. We're trying to do is we're trying to help you. So what we find in Acts chapter 15 is these guys are trying to do this. We looked at the, this is be a good example to look at the moral foundations theory to find out what, what category of morality this disagreement exists in because it's not an epistemic disagreement. It's a moral disagreement. So that's where moral foundations theory comes in to help you with that. By the way, ideologues think moralistically. They don't think epistemically. Epistemics come second. Epistemics comes as apologetics. They have moral intuitions. And then the epistemics come to fill in the moral intuitions. I highly recommend you read the book, The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. It's right there on the right-hand side. The righteous, get that book and read it. And uh, a lot more of life will start to make sense to you. Eventually, when I update the website, I'm going to have a list of books that um, I'm going to recommend people read. Now notice this, this goes around, we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. Now where are they doing that? They're doing that in Gentile territories. Where are some of the Gentile territories? The Gentile territories are some of these areas over here, okay? Asia Minor. Now notice Galatia, all right? This whole thing which you, which you would call Turkey today we would call Asia Minor today. 
but in the Bible, it's just called Asia. Now notice right in the middle of this, it is Galatia. Right in the middle of this is the region of Galatia. That's why when you look at the book of Galatians, um, it is written to the churches, plural of Galatia, because it's a region, right? You have, a, you have Ephesus is written to the church, singular at Ephesus, because that's a city. But the church is of Galatia because that's a region with lots of cities in it. Galatia is not a city, it's a region. Kind of like um, I'm in Louisiana, it's a state. There are lots of churches in Louisiana. There's lots of churches in each city today, but it wasn't, that, it wasn't like that back then. So hopefully you get my point on this. So noting, knowing the geography there. Notice what, this is 2 Timothy, Paul's writing this, we think he's writing it in about 64 AD, very shortly before his death. This thou knowest, that all they which be in Asia are turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. What's going on in Asia? Probably this right here. Why do we know that? Because when you look at the book of Galatians, somebody has gone through Galatia telling these guys exactly that. And Paul is not preaching that, therefore all they which be in Asia are turned away from me. In the early church, in, you notice, what would that be? That would be a different denomination. That would be a change of beliefs or something like that. You have Paul preaching one thing, and then all these people in Asia, Galatia, being taught something else. So you have factionalism right off the bat, even in the New Testament. You have factionalism. People think that all the denominations and factionalism that we have are a result of centuries and years. It was, it was already there in the, in the first century. They already had problems. Um, Paul continues in the same book, next chapter, shame, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. And we've done a whole video on this. this is a video with me and Nick talking about profanity. And the profanity is... A rec when you become a mouthpiece of an ideological propaganda, that is profane and vain babblings. It's not talking about cussing or swearing. It's talking about being a mouthpiece for stagnant, stale, ideological propaganda. That is, okay, a lot of people on this channel, uh, let me give you an example. If you're a Calvinist, and when you talk to people, your idea is you are trying to point people toward being persuaded of Calvinism, that is profane and vain babblings. Um, OSAS, if once saved, always saved, eternal security. Listen to me. If you, when you are talking people, if you are trying to point be, people to being persuaded of OSAS, then that is pr profane and vain babblings. If you are trying to point people to be persuaded against OSAS, that is profane and vain babblings. Are you hearing me? You see? It's not just the correctness or incorrectness of the propositions that you are trying to report, you know, persuade people of. It has to do with whether or not you are interacting with people in a way that transforms them so that they can do better first principles thinking themselves. That's something I want you to work on. If you're in a Bible study and you think OSAS is true, you need to figure out how to work with people that gets them to exercise first principles thinking without you trying to persuade them of what you think is true about OSAS, for example. And if you think OSAS is not true, you need to learn how to work with people without biasing and corrupting your interaction to where you're trying to convince them that it's not true, but you actually lead them to first principles thinking with the genuine earnest idea that when they apply a first principles thinking, they could rightly change your mind. That is the right way to do it. And if you are trying to just lead people toward the conclusions that you think are true, you are wrong and you are doing profane and vain babblings. And their word was, will eat as doth a canker, we would say cancer, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth, Philetus, who, who concerning the truth, have erred saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Now that goes into the model. We believe that following the pattern of Jesus Christ in a fractal fashion in every area of life, there is always a resurrection of the cost. You put in a cost and there's always 
an ROI, you might say, a return on investment. There's always a resurrection that comes after committing the work and the cost or the life, whatever it is. And when that pattern is disrupted and the resurrection that we're looking forward to is already passed, then that big fractal pattern, the, the largest version of the fractal pattern is disrupted and then it no longer carries over into the smaller areas. Going to do a whole video on that soon, coming soon to a city near you. So be sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and stay tuned for the more videos that we have coming this way. So when they get to Galatia, now notice this is very important too. We have just a couple minutes left, so I need to cram this in and make sure you get this. I was um, on one of our Wednesday nights sessions, I was lamenting how after I came out of Calvinism, I was lamenting how somebody could be so deceived into Calvinism. And so I'm trying to figure out how the human mind works, in groups, out groups, mentors, ash negativity, all these kinds of things play into why people become Calvinists and how people get let out. We, we think that it's epistemic things. Like if you had the best argument for the, trans, for the interpretation of John 6.44, it would get somebody out of Calvinism. No, it won't. You, you could tell people the truth all day long, but as long as they are surrounded by an in-group and have mentors and peer networks, all those kinds of things in place, that is what's keeping them in Calvinism. It has nothing to do with how good or bad the arguments are, typically. Now, every once in a while, you're going to come across somebody who's probably a little older than 40, who's studying things on their own, who comes out of Calvinism, irrespective of whether or not they are in or outside of an in-group. But typically, below 40 especially, um, People are very ash positive and they are conforming to an in-group, a peer and mentor network, that kind of thing. And you're not going to get them out of Calvinism without changing that and or without some, also some kind of major life transition, such as a divorce, a death in the family, getting fired, a uh, church split, something like that happening. Okay. Um, so th those kinds of things are very, you need to understand also your body as a data processor, polyvagal theory, limbic hijacking, your hypothalamus, understanding how your body works as a data processor and how it can be compromised and overran and like your emotional system, that sort of stuff. You need to understand how all that stuff can work against you when you're trying to determine, determine what, what the truth of something is. Okay. Now, Paul, under so the other day I was mentioning that. Like, how is it that people, and somebody who was an ideologue said, well, you should just go back to Romans 1. Well, that didn't answer the problem, you see? And that kind of, that, that's, a, that's an ideologue moralistically referring back to an authority, um, moral foundation here. Where is, the, where is the authority one? I think I've gone too far. The Authority Subversion Moral Foundation. Well, now I've cited the authority. Now they feel more moral for, like, we all think the Bible's true, so I've quoted, I've referenced Romans 1, and now I'm, I'm morally and righteously and virtuously superior to you for actually trying to solve the problem. I've just quoted a verse which doesn't make you any more effective, doesn't give you any more understanding, doesn't make you any more agentic toward trying to solve this problem that you have. All right? We don't want to be ideologues like that. We want to actually explore and solve these problems and not dismissively shut things down with moralistic references to agreed upon authority sources. All right? So that's, that's not how we want to do things at all. So I was trying to figure that, so that's what happened. And I want people to understand that Paul understood something about how the human mind works and how you have to do things the right way. I'll give you an example. Paul says, now, Paul's out there preaching to a bunch of Gentiles, and in Jerusalem, they're not having Gentile stuff, okay? It's all Jewish-centric still, very much so in Jerusalem. So then 14 years after, Paul says, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them with the gospel, which I preached among the Gentiles. Now, what's he talking about? He's, talk he's not talking about lost people. He's talking about James, and John and Cephas, who seem to be pillars. He's talking about these guys. He's not talking about lost people. Now look what he says. I communicate unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. He's going around to Perga and Lystra and Antioch, Pisidia, preaching to the Gentiles. But privately to them which are of reputation, 
lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. What does that mean? These people like James, Cephas, and John. Just because Paul has the truth doesn't mean that good guys, here, I have it in writing right here, merely having the truth does not automatically mean that good people will accept it. Paul had to consider in-group dynamics, reputations, leadership, mentor relations, unity of effort factors, and many other aspects. So Paul is like, James, Peter, John, these guys are good guys, but if I call them out in public and make this big difference thing, they're going to oppose me. Not because I'm wrong, but because that's how in-group, out-group dynamics work. And people are going to feel threatened. They're going to desire to have the preeminence. They're going to be triggered. They're going to be limbically hijacked. They're going to get in defensive mode and they're going to reject what I am saying. And then I won't be able to have the impact on the church that God has called me to have. So just because God has called you to do something does not mean you can act without wisdom. Paul knows very well that he has to act with wisdom. He has to understand how humans act as data processors, even though these guys are apostles, they are still subject to going in, you know, polyvagal system, go into defense mode, get defensive about their beliefs, try to protect the thing they have going. He knows all that. He knows all that. And so he very wisely goes to them what? He goes to them privately, lays it all out for them in private so that they can consider this matter without feeling like what they have going on is being attacked and that their followership is being preached out from underneath them or something like that, but that they're all on the same sheet of music, then they can emerge from this private meeting all on the same sheet of music. You see? That's the kind of thing. When I ask questions like, it makes me wonder how I was convinced to be a Calvinist back when I was and how anybody could be, and then what could be done to prevent other people from being so deceived like I was. This is the kind of thing. Paul had some wisdom here about human about how humans work as data processors, and he was sensitive to that. And he operated with that wisdom, knowledge, and understanding about how people work as data processors. And I, if I present this data, the fact that it's right isn't going to matter if I don't present it wisely with consideration for all these other factors that will affect whether or not they receive this true thing that I have to say. You understand what I'm saying? Just because you have something true to say doesn't mean that it's automatically going to be received well if you present it in a very unwise way. Read the room, okay? That kind of thing. Understand what you get yourself into. Neither Titus was with me, who neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. So they don't have to be circumcised. And because false brethren unaware brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, they might bring us into bondage. To, so they're trying to say, we caught these guys doing these Gentile things, and they're not really Christians, and we need to make them do all these things. But to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. We didn't let these guys intimidate us at all, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat in conference, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Whatsoever they were, make, this is in parentheses, whatsoever it were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. So all these people, they're in conference together, and you have, imagine Paul going up against a bunch of people who all seem to be in agreement, ridiculing what he's saying. He's like, I don't care what they, you know, ridicule, whatever. But these guys of reputation, it mattered to them, privately to them, which are a reputation. So he's, he's got this thing, He's applying understanding of how group dynamics works. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, Gentiles, was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, Jews, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they under the circumcision. And they said, well, only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I was also forward to do. Now notice that. James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars. Now, James, Peter, and John, by this point, this is not the same James that is James, Peter, and John 
James and John, the sons of Zebedee? No. This is James, the brother of Jesus, because James, the son of Zebedee, the apostle of the Gospels, he is dead, Acts chapter 12. This is James, the brother of Jesus. But anyway, in Jerusalem, notice it says, who seemed to be pillars. Now ask yourself, if they seemed to be pillars, who's the Pope? There, Cephas here is another name for Peter. Peter is not the Pope if somebody has to seem to be Peter, uh, uh, <laughs> pillars. If you go back to Acts chapter 15, and you look at what Peter's doing, Peter, Peter starts talking in Acts chapter 15, verse 7. Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, da da da, gives them the story of what happened at Cornelius. And after they held their peace, James answered. Now they're at Jerusalem. Now this whole, the missionary sending out, all this kind of stuff has been going on at Antioch. The whole Gentile-centric version of the church that's been going on has, has kind of been headquartered in Antioch, Syria. And now they're going back to Jerusalem to get everybody on the same sheet of music here. And James answered saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me, da 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 uh, And so he says, James, brother of Jesus, not even one of the twelve apostles, Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them from the beginning, which from the, among the Gentiles are turned to God. What's going on here? James is in the position to dole out a sentence on how something should be handled. He's not even one of the 12 apostles. He's the brother of Jesus. Peter is there. Paul is there. They're in Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas were sent out from Antioch, Syria. And now here they all are bringing this to James for James to dole out what should be done about it. Who is James? If Peter was the Pope, couldn't he just dictate what it was? So what's happening here with the apostles is that you have, I have this in red writing here, little red writing font, informal, unofficial leadership and influence and relationships. Paul was able to read the room, so to say. There is no, there is no prince of apostles. It's not like Peter was in charge of everybody. It was he wasn't the one doling out that sentence for what to do. James was the presiding elder in Jerusalem, and Antioch was the center from where Paul and Barnabas were sent out. Who's the boss here? Where's the, huh, where's the denominational headquarters? You see, where. Where's the hierarchical system? It's not, there's not really a hierarchy. There's not any one clearly defined leader like Peter or James. But James, since they're in Jerusalem and James is in charge at Jerusalem, it's his call. It's his call. It's very interesting how that works that way. Now, some other things that I want to get into is how Peter had to be withstood to the face. We'll cover that next time. How, and Peter was wrong. Um... John Mark, the disagreement over John Mark, which is very much worth talking about, and how Paul goes back to Jerusalem, where James is the presiding elder in Acts chapter 21, and he takes what, by all accounts, it seems to be a Nazarite vow, and goes into the temple where a, an animal is to be sacrificed for this ceremony that he's participating in. And a lot of people think he did a mistake by doing that. So as you're looking at what these guys are doing, you're, you're looking at these apostles. You got Paul preaching one thing. Paul gets onto Peter for, let me, let me show you that too, because that's important. Paul gets onto Peter because before the people came from James, Jerusalem, he was eating with the Gentiles. Peter was. And when they were come, James's crew, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Oh, you're over here eating ham sandwiches and drinking caffeine? What's going on with that? Eating shrimp and uh, <laughs> eating owls? And the other, the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. And when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, this is up in Antioch, by the way, 
and not as do the Jews. Why compel us all the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So Peter had to be corrected here. Big deal. What do you have going on? Another, somebody wrote to me, and I can't find this. If you are the person, somebody wrote to me why they thought James was wrong in Acts chapter 15. And they gave me a, like a, a bulleted list of reasons why what happened in Acts 15 was an error and a mistake. And I, th- I found that comment very interesting. Now, problem is this. I can't find it in my email. I can't find it in my messenger for Facebook, uh, for Beyond the Fundamentals or Personal. And I can't find it in the comments on the channel. So if you know where that comment is, or if you were the one who wrote it and deleted it or whatever, I thought that comment was very interesting. And I I intended to talk about it today, but couldn't find it. And I looked for it since Thursday. Okay. So if you are the person who wrote that, or if you know where I can find that, maybe it is in the YouTube comments and I'm just searching by the wrong terms or something. um, Let me know where that is, because that's very interesting. I want to look at that too. But understand this, the leadership in the first century church, in the apostolic era church, is not very clearly defined. There's new information that's being introduced. Up until Acts 15, there is no unity of the gospel and doctrine or anything like that that we would recognize today that is, that is going on. They don't, they're not even preaching to Gentiles as of Acts 11, 19. They're not even doing that. Lots of transitions happening in the book of Acts, and there's a lot of mistakes and error, like people going, there's a lot of uh, dissimulation and subversion going on. There's people going around preaching to Gentiles that you've got to be circumcised and keep the law to be saved, and that's not the case. And then, and then you have the whole book of Galatians written to address that issue, all they which be in Asia are turned away from me. Uh, Paul, so there's all kinds of problems in the early church. So when you read the book of Acts, do not think that everything you see Peter doing is good. Do not think that everything you see Paul doing is right or good. Do not assume that. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Just because Peter baptizes Cornelius doesn't mean that he should have, you see? Whatever you see going on, it's just an account of what happened. It's just Luke trying to tell you what happened. He is not trying to tell you that everything that happened is infallible. Just because it's scripture, Everything they're doing is right. No, scripture is true in that it's telling you what really happened, but it's not telling you that these guys were infallible. They're not. They're all making mistakes. All making mistakes. And this is this is a record of some of the mistakes they made. And you also need to understand that the church, the church history is it church history is The early church fathers were were, were the church babies. They weren't the fathers of anything. All right. We're supposed to be growing up into the full grown stature of the image of Christ. And that, that takes time. And that's what we're trying to do here on this channel is to promote that. Um, Got some messages recently from some of our FSI crew about different ways that we could do this more assertively. Um, So I'm interested in that kind of difficult to juggle that and personal life, but hopefully one day soon we can be very intentional about growing this concept of the body of Christ with everybody else as well. But yeah, we are supposed to be growing and we're aiming at, at transformation. We're aiming at becoming our sacred second self. We're aiming at becoming more like Christ. We're oriented toward that, not toward semantically disambiguated propositional truth claims, which do absolutely nothing for you or anybody else except cause division, derision, and cause you to emulate the behaviors that are found in people with cluster B personality disorders, which we have no need for any of that to be going on. We don't want something in our life that replicates that kind of thing. We want to be like Christ, not stagnant, stale pond water. All right, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.